Good morning. Uh, have all of you identified your nearest exit? <laughs> okay, then we can go ahead and get started. I'm John Edlin. I'm, I'm the president here. And uh, it's my great good pleasure to, to welcome you to this program. Uh, it's appropriate, I think, uh, certainly, that we are dedicating a seminar room to David Maury. I mean, because, think about it, when you envision Leonard Bernstein, he's standing in front of an orchestra and simply holding the baton, right? When you think of David, he's sitting at a round table, or maybe it's a rectangular one, surrounded by students, and he's conducting a seminar. So a seminar room is perfectly appropriate. And it's also nice, believe me, to dedicate a space to someone who has not yet, in Hamlet's words, shuffled off this mortal coil. <laughs> so David, you must feel a bit like Tom Sawyer did, who snuck back into the church, right? Uh, and he watched his own funeral, <laughs> and he heard all the nice things that the minister said about him. Yeah. Uh, it's good. You only, you only get that opportunity once. But David, I've got to tell you something. This means... I hope you realize this, that henceforth and forevermore, you cannot do anything to publicly embarrass us. <laughs> okay. okay. So you, I hope you've gotten all that out of your system. Yeah. Okay, good. Just think Pete Rose, okay? <laughs> Bernie Madoff, <laughs> Harvey Weinstein, all those hospitals, those rooms that are named for them, and the scholarships and the programs and the endowments. All of them was rescinded. So, I think if you promise not to, then we can go ahead and proceed with this. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a risk worth taking, actually. Uh, so, Dave, thank you, and let's get on with the program. It's my pleasure now uh, to introduce to you Joseph DeSalvo, the class of 89, who is the chief security officer of the New York City private equity company Blackstone and a former FBI agent. Joe has served on the Plattsburgh Alumni Association Board since 1998, including several terms on the Executive Committee, and he's currently the Board President. So Joe, the floor is yours. I'm going to start today by reading a letter that I wrote. February 22, 2000. Dear Nominating Committee, it is with great enthusiasm that I submit this letter along with my overwhelming endorsement in support of Dr. David Doc Mowry's promotion to the rank of Distinguished Teaching Professor. If ever there was a person of distinction, it is Dr. Mowry, and if ever there was someone to be selected for this high honor, it too is Dr. Mowry. If this letter does nothing else, I hope it will tell the story of a humble man who demonstrates a commitment and dedication worthy of everyone's admiration. Someone who has pledged his life's endeavors to teaching both academics and life to all those who are lucky enough to know him. He is a man of unimpeachable ethics with an energy and passion for his work that most can only hope to achieve. To be sure, Plattsburgh is a better place because of him. There is no doubt that history will judge this man for the many meaningful contributions he made to the college, his colleagues, his students, and the local community. Now the most important sentence. Only history will tell whether that will take the form of dedicating a garden, building, or perhaps even more appropriately, the honor center in his name. I wrote that in February of 2000 when I was honored to be asked to write a letter of support for Dr. Mary's promotion to distinguished teaching professor. So now, on behalf of Marty Maddox, Chair of the College Council, I will now read the resolution passed by the College Council to permanently name the David and Mowry Seminar Room. <clears throat> Whereas David and Mowry, PhD, served SUNY Plattsburgh for 40 years with distinction, was a SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor, Director of the Honors Center, and Professor of Philosophy at the time of his retirement in 2011, and whereas during a sabbatical leave in 1981, Dr. Mary developed a proposal to restore a college-wide honors program, which was started by Dr. Edward E. Redkay in 1964, 
but languished after Red Kay's retirement in the 1970s, and whereas Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Jerome P. Supple, agreed to reform an honors program and appointed Dr. Mayer as director of the inception of the program in 19, at the inception of the program in 1984, and whereas Dr. Mowry invested himself deeply into faculty-student relationships, mentored thousands of students, and continues to maintain enduring relationships which, with countless alumni to this day, and whereas Dr. Mowry is renowned for his commitment to the study of the humanities, the development of critical thinking, and was a catalyst in the evolution of SUNY Plattsburgh from a college focused on professional studies to a truly comprehensive college, and whereas 45 alumni, faculty, staff, and friends of the college have gifted $35,000 in two months in order to honor <coughs> Dr. Mowry for his profound impact. Now, therefore, be it resolved from the College Council of the State University of New York at Plattsburgh, officially recommends to the president that the area within the Red K Honors Center, formerly known as Honors Seminar Room B, be formally and permanently named as the David and Mowry Seminar Room. And be it further resolved that the College Council thanks Dr. Mowry for his service to the campus and community and wishes him the very best. Signed, Martin D. Mannix, Jr., Class of 1964, Chair, College Council. Thank you. I'd now like to um, introduce Dr. Tracy Church Guzio, Director of the Honors Center and Professor of English. Dr. Guzio joined the SUNY Plattsburgh faculty in 2000 as an assistant professor, where she developed African American literature courses. She received the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2008. Dr. Guzio was promoted to full professor in 2012. In addition to directing the Honors Center, where about 375 students are enrolled in the Honors Program, she continues to serve as coordinator of Africana Studies. Um, I'd also like to add that as a junior faculty member, um, that within the first few weeks of arriving at Plattsburgh, newly minted, um, there were four special people on campus who reached out to me and tried to make themselves available. Uh, those people, Ann Tracy, Tom Moran, Doug Scott, and of course, Dave Mowry, each personally welcomed me and offered their help and guidance in my new position. Many of the successes of my career at Plattsburgh I owe to their mentorship, but also to the role models that they offered me as teachers and campus citizens. I still look at them as kind of like the four musketeers or that cool group of kids at your new school <laughs> who you hope they'll ask to invite to their parties. Um, so I made perfect sense. It made perfect sense that as much as possible I gravitated to their you know, places on campus, hence the Honor Center. I wouldn't be here today without Dave's advice and support over the last 18 years. And for his continued guidance now in my role as director, I have to share that I've been teaching pretty regularly in Seminar B, uh, at least for the past two years. And shortly into the semester, they came in and put a picture of Dave in the room, directly overlooking the seat that I tend to take <laughs> <coughs> while I'm teaching. So. Um, He's literally looking over my shoulder <laughs> while I'm sitting there. I'm not even right there. So I've moved around a few times because it was a little unnerving, uh, but now he's staring at me <laughs> wherever I teach. And the class is American Gothic, so there are a lot of stories about people being haunted by portraits. <laughs> so I'm talking about haunted portraits, and there's one kind of staring at me. To say the least, it's keeping me very honest while I'm teaching, I'm very mindful of my role in the classroom. These last few courses that I have offered in the Maori Room, as we'll now start calling it pretty regularly, all follow a similar theme. Considering the ways that places in our history become narratives for our cultural experiences and our visions of who we are as a society. I couldn't help but think that's what we're all gathered here today to do. And the Honor Center is a place with chairs and many sided tables and couches and a place to hang out and study, to commiserate with friends during midterms, 
a place where students take some of the best seminars with some of the most outstanding professors on campus, a place to build memories of their time in a special community. But of course, the center and the seminar room is much, much more. It's a symbol of Dave's vision of our campus. It's the story of his dedication to this institution and to its students, of the ideal community he imagined while promoting the possibilities of higher learning, of finding ways to challenge students and facilitate their intellectual growth, and to be inclusive of diverse opinions and cultures. Today, the center and this room speaks to all who enter, casting a spell over them with this magnificent tale of a place where their journey can begin. Many of you in this room today may have been there when Dave first saw his dream take shape, or when the seminar tables were installed, or you may have had the pleasure of taking classes in this room with the founder himself. I know each of you will have a moment to thank him again today, but I would like to stand here for just a moment and thank Dave on behalf of all the future students and faculty and visitors. The ones who are not here yet, the ones who haven't even been born, Though the center in these rooms will someday have new paint, or new couches, or a new secretary, a new director, this story will continue. Students will enter the Dave Maori seminar room knowing that they have entered a magical, mythical place that will help them all reach the potential that Dave imagined for them. All of us here know how you, Dave, and the Honor Center made our own transformations possible. We know what wonders these future honor students will discover because of you. All right. I have to point very emotional. <laughs> um, so I'm now introducing Tony Ann Nichols, class of 1988, who is the senior managing counsel for Xerox Corporation, where she supervises a team of lawyers who counsel on a wide variety of employment and HR matters. Tony has served on the Plattsburgh Alumni Board since 2001, including several terms on the executive committee of the board and the board president. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today to be able to celebrate Dr. Mallory and his long-standing commitment to the college and to the honors program. Dedicating the honors program seminar room in his honor is a fitting tribute to the man who had a vision of what an honors program could be and the dedication to make that vision a reality. When I was first sitting down to write these remarks, I struggled initially, not because I didn't have the words to sing Dave's praises, because those words come easily, but because I felt so close to him, I wanted my remarks to transcend our personal relationship. And then I thought to myself, wait, that's exactly what makes Dave so special. Year over year, Decade over decade, he has made students feel unique and special. You know, it's funny. It was never my intention to go to Plattsburgh. I came up for a campus interview and a tour, basically to appease my parents, who wanted me to include a SUNY school in my search. <laughs> um, so during the interview process, the admissions counselor suggested that I meet with Dave to discuss participating in this new fledgling honors program. And so she called over to Dave and asked if he had a few moments to speak with a prospective student. And he said yes. I later came to realize, as I grew to know him, that he always said yes when it came to students. So I went over to his office, fully anticipating a very brief conversation about the parameters and requirements of the honors program. And an hour later, we were still chatting, and our conversation had gone far beyond the confines of the honors program. And when I left his office that afternoon, I knew two things. I knew, first, I was going to Plattsburgh, and second, that he was going to be a mentor and a friend to me throughout my college experience. And you have been that, and so much more, for over 30 years. As others have spoken about, the honors program had very humble beginnings. A handful of students, two seminars, one room, and not much else. But it was the most exciting place to be on the campus. I knew I was a part of something special, and I knew in large part that was because of you. 
Dave's commitment to students was unwavering. His enthusiasm for the program was contagious, and his commitment to the program was steadfast. Students were so excited to go to the weekly seminars because it gave us an experience different from what we had in the classroom. It was an opportunity for us to find our voice, to be able to speak rather than merely just be spoken to. I was fortunate enough to be um, a part of the honors program in the fall of 1984, which was the first um, semester that the honors program was offered. And at that time, there were two seminars that were offered. Men, Women, and Love, which was an English literature sem seminar, and Democracy in America, which was a political science seminar. And I was a freshman English lit major at the time, so it probably seems like a no-brainer that I would have taken Men, Women, and Love, but Dave actually persuaded me to take Democracy in America. And when I asked him, you know, well, gee, why should I take that? And he said, you know, we're often we often gravitate towards the things that we know we can do well, but those aren't necessarily the things that help us to grow. And so I said, okay, and I made the decision to take that seminar, and that led me on a path to law school and a career that I've enjoyed for over 25 years. And that was one of the first lessons that he has taught me over the years as a mentor and as a dear friend. Dave was and is a champion of students. When we suffered disappointments, he encouraged us. When we hit milestones, he celebrated it. He was with us every step of the way, helping us navigate our personal, career, academic journeys. There was always a parade of students outside his office waiting to speak with him uh, about everything from course selection, graduate schools, references, things going on in their lives, things going on in the world. And even though he had mountains of papers on, him, on his desk, indicative of all the work that he had to do as a philosophy professor and an honors program director, he never turned us away. He never made us feel like we were wasting his time. He always made us feel like we were the most important person at that moment. His energy for his students knew no bounds. Over the years, I have often commented that I didn't think the program would have grown to the extent that it did without his steadfast commitment. And when I would say this, he would look at me and very humbly and modestly always say, no, it was the students who made the program a success. And while certainly the students were an integral part of the program, um, it was Dave who made the honors program a community and its students a family. And After all this, you may be surprised to know that I never took a class with Dave over my four years of life. <laughs> but, but I always considered myself one of his students and he one of my greatest teachers. I know I speak for hundreds of students, if not thousands, when I say you have had a profound impact on my life. I am blessed to know you and so proud to be part of your living legacy. Thank you. And now, thank God, I get to choose somebody else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. My dear friend, Justin Elmendorf. Justin is class of 2004. He's the technical manager for CNBC Field Operations. Uh, Justin has served on the Plattsburgh Alumni Association Board of Directors since 2012. He currently serves as the second vice president. And on a personal note, I met Justin when he was a student in the honors program and I was an alum. I had come back for homecoming and Doc had set up these uh, honors program coffee houses where alums and students could get together, and that's how we first met. And the, the rest is history. <laughs> Take it away, Justin. Still morning? <laughs> yes, it is. Two minutes. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> You're going to notice a lot of similar themes uh, with all these speeches, I would imagine. So 
Uh, the first is, is just being honored to be standing up here to take part in the renaming of Honor Seminar Room B after my professor, my mentor, and my friend, David Mowry. Like Tony, I've been trying to wrap my head around how to fit in almost 20 years of memories into four to six minutes. But if I wanted to say everything I could want to say about Doc, we would probably get to the reception of the Honor Center during the 2019 homecoming. <laughs> so I will do my best in four to six minutes. I'm going to start off by saying that there was no way any room besides Seminar Room B could have this honor. It's the room where I was fortunate enough to be your student twice, and your TA, my sophomore year, which is when Helen was born. That room is special because it has the perfect view of Hawkins Pond, and I'm going to let everyone in on a little secret. The renovations to the pond had nothing to do with plumbing or anything of that sort. Doc and I did so many laps around that pond in four years that eventually the pavement and the foundation were <laughs> So after all those years of construction, you see the pond you see out there today. So, sorry Dr. Edmund. <laughs> but Doc, those laps around the pond were among the best times of my four years at Plattsburgh State. You never said no, and we talked about everything, from classes to relationships and everything in between. You gave amazing career advice, and we even sprinkled in some sports as well. But my team just lost, so I'm going to leave that there. <laughs> but it made me so happy last summer when my wife and I brought my oldest son up to Plattsburgh, who had, at the time was two and a half. And not only did I get to take him for a walk around Hawkins Pond and share with him a memory that's always been so special with me, but to have you and Ruth open your home to us and walking around your pond with you and my son created one of the most special memories I'm always going to keep. I also have an eight-month-old now, so you only one. <laughs> I also want to thank you for instilling in me the initiative to always strive to do better. And that initiative started when I wrote my first paper for you in that fall freshman seminar. My very first college paper. I thought I did a really good job for my first go-around <laughs> college papers. And indeed, I was told by Doc it was a good job, B+. Plus. But I saw that B+, plus and I just knew I had to do better. So I spent the next two weeks doing more research and putting even more effort into that paper. Even seen Jim Leary for help, one of the TAs in my freshman seminar. And I was so proud of it, and I got that paper back the following week, and Doc wrote, Justin, much better paper, great job, B+. Plus. <laughs> So that was the very first lesson I learned at Plattsburgh State, was how a B-plus was better than a B-plus. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, that was probably one of our first walks around the pond, Doc. You're teaching me how a B-plus was better than a B-plus. But it later occurred to me that without you actually telling me how to do it, it was that guided discovery that I figured out how to make that B-plus an A, and that is what I got in that first freshman seminar with you. And that was probably the best part of learning from you. Anyone can stand up in a classroom and tell us how to learn. You made us want to learn without even saying a word. And to this day, when I go to work, I still try to make my next B-plus better than my last B-plus. Please don't tell my boss I give him a B-plus effort every day. <laughs> but thank you for that important life lesson. And I also want to thank Ruth, Melissa, Helen, and Alex for sharing you with us for all these years. Thank you for inviting over 30 years of alumni into your family, and I would hope that I speak for those alumni in saying that you are a special part of ours. We love you, I love you, and there is no one more deserving this honor. Although when we met with Doc over the summer, we told him about this, and we heard this news, and as Tony said, and, and Joe, how humble of a man Doc is, he said that there, wish, there could be a way to name the room after every student who crossed those doors into the Honor Center. To which, at the time, we didn't have the heart to tell him that we didn't quite reach that fundraising goal. <laughs> so the David and Mowry seminar room it is, as it should be, and now always will be. Congratulations, Doc, and thank you. I'm proud to introduce our next speaker, Bashir Abdallah, graduating class of 2012 is the Vice President of Strategy for Service Channel, which is a New York City-based software company 
He lives in Burlington, Vermont with his wife, Emily Necrossum, who is also an alumnus of Plattsburgh State and the Honors Program. Bashir. So, Tony had a good description of Doc when she said uh, that he has had <clears throat> a profound effect on, on his students. He certainly had a profound effect on me and my life, and my, my trajectory as a student, as well as a professional. Uh, you know, I had an interesting path to the Honors Seminar and to Plattsburgh State, a very unconventional one. I think we have many of the students who are in the Honors Program are very bright, uh, intelligent, articulate, intellectual students, and I would not necessarily describe myself as that coming in. Um, I sort of grew up a little bit all over the world and, um, and had a very unconventional background when it came to education. I lived in, I was born in New York City, lived in the Caribbean island of St. Croix where I uh, wasn't very welcome there. I was a little bit too white for the people who lived there. I moved to the West Bank, to the Middle East, and depending on what side of the wall I was, I was too American or too Palestinian. And of course, when I family and I moved to upstate New York to the Cooperstown area. We were maybe a little bit too brown for, for the folks up there. So you know, I had a very interesting background. When you move around that much, you don't have a great education. You don't have any consistency in an education. So I came to Plat Plattsburgh State as somewhat of an angry young man. Um, and, uh, and I met Bob Harsh in the EOP program. I was a summer student there. And for a few years, Bob would tell me, you know, you should meet Dr. Mowry. You should meet Dr. Mowry. And I said, you yeah, know, I'll get around to it, I'll get around to it. And I think it was during a, a very difficult time in my life in 2003 that, uh, you know, just a, a week before the, uh, the classes started in January, I finally did meet Dr. Mowry. And, um, and we sat down and we had a very good, concise conversation. And, and I could clearly see that here in front of me was a man who was unconditionally supportive of his students and, and people around him, regardless of whatever walk of life you came from. And, uh, you know, I, I had a few classes that semester that I dropped out of, and I couldn't bring myself, and I, I was sort of on the verge of failing out, dropping out, and, and not probably staying in school. Um, which explains why I'm in class of 2012. It was actually supposed to be a class of 2004, but that's the case. Um, and, and so, so I just couldn't bring myself to drop out of uh, doctor's, Dr. Mowry's class. Uh, on, and, uh, and I think part of it is, for the first time in my life, I felt a sense of home in, in Plattsburgh and at the Honor Seminar. And, you know, certainly uh, valued in a way as a student that I'd never been valued before. And, um, and you know, Tony, you, you mentioned profound, and that, that's, that's exactly how I would describe Doc. Um, you mean a great deal to myself and to Emily and to every student that you've ever uh, had, had, who's had the pleasure of, of being in a class with you or just having a conversation with you. Um, uh, you know, a few years, many years later, uh, Doc and Ruth were kind enough to attend our wedding, and Doc was uh, very kind enough to officiate our wedding. Uh, in, in, uh, at Balfour here. So I, I, would, I would just end with the fact that, you know, your impact on me and on the students has been an amazing one. Uh, we, we truly love you, and, and this, this honor is, is very well deserved. You're a great man, and um, we, we all think so very highly of you. Dr. Thomas Moran. Uh, Tom has been a very close colleague and friend of David's for over 35 years. He's, the, he's also the Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs here at Plattsburgh for almost a decade in the 1990s, during which time the Honors Program was under his purview. Dr. Moran later became Director of the Institute of Ethics in Public Life, which was closely aligned administratively with the Honors Program. He was also a Distinguished Service Professor and frequently taught in the Honors Center. You know, as I sat here, I, uh, I thought of Ed Redkay once describing himself 
in uh, his office, which was in the back hall of Hawkins. <clears throat> and the president uh, was in the front hall. Now, Doc was the dean of the college, but he said he was the caboose, and the engine was in the front hall. I listened to these talks and thought, I am going to be the caboose this afternoon. <laughs> they were wonderful talks, and John Etling leaned over to me and said, these are wonderful talks. Um, you make us proud. Thank you. Almost half a century ago, Dave came to Plattsburgh. He could have gone to almost any other college or university. He was exceptionally bright and professionally capable. He epitomized a new generation of dynamic teacher scholars at our college. He might have made his mark at a research institution, pumping out articles and books for other scholars. But he soon discovered he had a calling in teaching and he's lived a teacher's life. Dave's early devotion to teaching eventually ramified into a much larger project. He spent 30 years, as you've heard, constructing and cultivating a place, a place the Honor Center, where excellence and caring and teaching were made palpable. That place continues to endure and thrive, and we are here today to name a part of it in tribute to him. In the early 1980s, Dave Spayer headed, as you've learned again, the initiative to establish the Honors Program. He drew together a group of like-minded faculty to work on the project. But more than any other person, he articulated a vision for the program. He persuaded the campus of the value of the program, secured resources for it, designed a beautiful facility to house it, attracted faculty to teach in it, and students to participate in it. Essentially, they founded a college within our college. It is a, leg a legacy that has yielded a transformative impact on the more than 2,500 students who have directly benefited from the program. Despite these extraordinary accomplishments, it was his immediate, personally present engagement with students as a teacher that is the legacy that is no doubt most meaningful to him. Edward Doc Redkay, after whom the Honor Center is named, was a revered teacher to generations of students in his time at the college, in much the way that Dave was in his. Doc Redkay had an abiding love of teaching. He thought of it as one of the greatest privileges a man or woman can earn. Dave feels exactly the same way. I've never known anyone happier with the choices they have made in life. He constantly talks about how remarkably fortunate he has been in his life's work, and it has clearly been a calling, not a job. And he was always available to students. I watched for years as a constant parade of students came through the honors program every day. He knew every student by name and, he, and greeted each of them with a warm smile. He ran an endless seminar, both in his office and in the seminar rooms, in which intellectual and personal development were woven together in a seamless tapestry of self-awareness and knowledge. With his unfailing good cheer and emotional steadiness, he nourished students' spirits and confidence, as well as their learning. He provided everything from personal advice to career counseling, and not infrequently, he engaged in surrogate parenting. His commitment to students was intent and remarkable. Perhaps one anecdote will serve to highlight the point. Quite some years ago, a student enrolled in the program told Dave he was going to have to drop out of college because he couldn't afford to pay the next semester's tuition. Given my administrative background, Dave asked me if there was anything that could be done. We both made a number of inquiries, and we were unable to resolve the situation on the student's behalf. A few days later, just as the student was about to leave campus, I made a phone call and a final, and what I feared would be a fruitless effort to help. I discovered that the student's tuition had been paid in full the day before. As it turned out, it was Dave who paid the student's bill, and I would have not known this had I not made that call. He didn't tell anyone. He just quietly did it. It was typical of him. The story may illustrate Dave's commitment to students, 
but that commitment was entirely recipro reciprocal. As you've heard today, students adored Dave. Another story illustrates the point. Nearly 20 years ago, some students decided to give Dave a Christmas present at the Honors Center uh, Association Holiday Banquet. They sent out the word to collect money for a gift. Within a few days, they had raised an enormous amount of money. Probably in today's dollars, close to $3,000. It was a staggering statement of generosity from a group of cash-strapped students and a lavish gift. A gift which, although the students probably never knew it, I'm sure was ultimately repaid by Dave as a donation to the College Foundation. He was equally committed to colleagues, which was consistent both with his character and his educational philosophy that faculty and students are all engaged in the same enterprise of developing increasing mastery of their capabilities. And so he was generous with his time with his fellow faculty members. Faculty sought his counsel on a wide range of issues, as well as access to his personal storehouse of intellectual understanding. I often walked into his office with some complex philosophical question about ethical theory. <clears throat> he would spontaneously provide an explanation of dazzling clarity and depth. <clears throat> the experience of working closely with Dave, in addition, of course, to the opportunity to engage students in the environment he so carefully shaped, had a vitalizing impact on virtually every faculty member who was connected to the program. His friendship has been indispensable to me, both in my work and my life. The renowned 19th century scholar William James observed that a teacher touches eternity because no one knows where his or her influence will end. In an echo of that observation, Doc Redke said that being a teacher is to be touched lightly by immortality. We are here today because Dave Mowry's life as a teacher has been touched lightly by immortality. Naming this seminar room in his honor makes that realization tangible for us and for future generations. Thank you, Dave and Ruth, and your entire family, <coughs> Melissa, Helen, and Alex, for what you have given our college family over the years. I want to do just two things this morning. I want to thank you all for this honor and for being here today. And then I want to tell you briefly about um, the honor seminar rooms here at the honor center. So how do I say thank you for all these comments? At first, I wasn't sure I was in the right place. I uh, couldn't recognize who they were talking about. <laughs> but President Netley, Joe, Dr. Guzio, Tony, Justin, Bashir, Ashley Gambino, who was a member of the planning committee for this event and, and couldn't be here because of other commitments today, um, and Tom, my thanks to each of you, not just for the nice things you've said, but for the years of friendship and the experiences in the honors program we have all shared, and for the opportunity to try to bring to life some ideas about education. As we were preparing our remarks, Tom and I um, shared some of the comments that we plan to make. Um, and Tom reminded me of a comment Lyndon Johnson made when he was president after an especially complimentary introduction. He said, if my parents were here, my father would have been very proud. 
My mother would have believed it. <laughs> I know what he meant. In a larger sense, my thanks to all of you who are alums of the program and are here today, or our colleagues who shared your knowledge and interest with your seminar students. And to my family and friends who provided continuous support over many years, Ruth, Melissa, Alex, Helen, Olin, Joyce, Steve, Matthew, Becky, well, as many of them as I could uh, along today, um, and to the countless friends and colleagues who have provided continuous support over many years. This dedication is for all of you, too. At the outset, I want to say a special thank you to five people without whose help the honors program wouldn't have developed as it has. People who understood and embraced the ideals of the program, its students, and its faculty. I mean, of course, the secretaries, who became partners in the effort to bring the honors program to life, and who each day nourished and embraced the ideals of the program and the goals that we had. Carol Blow, the very first secretary. Where are you, Carol? Thank there you, you are. <laughs> Lori Christofferson, our second secretary. <laughs> Judy Rodriguez, who I don't believe could be here today, but Colleen Bernard. Sandy Bolrus, my thanks to each of you. <laughs> Finally, as we all know, the annual homecoming weekend and all of its many events and activities wouldn't happen were it not for the hard work and planning of our Institutional Advancement Vice President, Ann Henson. <laughs> And Carrie Chapin Levine. Where are you, Carrie? There you go. Thank you both so very much and for everyone who works with you. So, as I thought about what to say this morning, I kept thinking about that old adage, never heard a bad short speech. <laughs> So I'm going to try to keep that in mind. So I want to try to explain to you as briefly as I can why naming the seminar room in the Honor Center has special meaning for me and for which I will always be grateful. Though the idea of providing a first-rate education for all of our students and the belief in the power of public higher education to transform lives has always been a part of the core of this college. Witness, for example, the scholars program Doc Redkay initiated so long ago, in the 1960s, in fact. But another program that was also designed to strengthen the college and give our students direct access to leading thinkers was actually the source of the current honors program. In the 1980s and 90s, the Distinguished Visiting Professor Program brought many scholars and writers, artists, scientists, and others to Plattsburgh for a period of residency as temporary faculty members. Several were Nobel laureates. One of the first Distinguished Visiting Professors was a world-renowned British philosopher named Stephen Tolman. <laughs> Stephen was in residence at the college for eight weeks, teaching classes, giving lectures, and helping our faculty with their own research projects. Toward the end of his stay, I asked him one evening at dinner what he thought about the college and what he thought we could do to make it even stronger. His response was simple. He said, you know, I've met some very bright and good students here. 
but they often don't seem to have much contact with each other. I think you should develop an honors program so they could take some classes together. So, from that simple suggestion, a long journey developed. I've often thought of the Honors Program and the Honors Center as an experiment in what might be called the ecology of education. That meant, among other things, designing an environment in which the ideals and activities of the Honors Program could thrive. There's much that could be said about the Honors Program, but in the interest of time, I want to focus on just one aspect of that environment the design, development, and evolution of the seminar rooms. If you think about it, we often do design spaces that fit and support the activities we want to pursue. For example, if you want to play basketball, it's a good idea to design a basketball court rather than a tennis court. <laughs> or if you want students to learn how to test their ideas in a science course, the science lab is a useful thing to have. Artistic talent is perhaps better nurtured in an art studio than in a library. You can make do with those mismatches, but I thought we could do better in designing our honors center to house the new honors program than we had done in our very first honors seminar room. Over the years, a distinguished committee of students and faculty work together to design the scaffold of the Honors Program. In fact, two members of that original committee, I think just two, are here this morning. Stu Denenberg, Stuart, where are you? Yes, indeed, Stuart. Um, and in a truly remarkable way, the other person who was a member of that committee is Ann Tracy. She was not only a member of that committee, but Anne is still teaching honors seminars on a regular basis from the beginnings of the program and that committee in 1982. And thank you for all of your efforts. Central to the conception of the honors program was the idea that dialogue and discussion in a seminar setting would engage students in the activity of learning rather than just listening passively to a lecture, sort of like you're doing right now, <laughs> and to take responsibility for their own education. Not really a novel idea, but the question became, what would an environment that encouraged that kind of experience be like? In other words, what should a seminar room be like? I began to think about the ways spaces can shape activities and purposes and purposes and activities can correlate with the environment they occur in. So let me tell you a few brief stories about the evolution of the Honor Center Seminar Rooms. Story one. At the very beginning, the Honors Program space in the Honor Center was very limited. And I mean very limited. In fact, Virtually the entire honor center was crammed into the space that now is the director's office. <laughs> right, Tracy? The seminar room was in the outer two-thirds of that current office, and the, uh, and, and the office that I shared with Carol Blow, our first secretary, was little more than a large closet. It was so small that Carol and I used to joke from time to time that we should have beepers installed on our desk chairs so that if we backed up, we could avoid going. <laughs> Another feature of the first honor center was that to get into the office part of the honor center, you had to go through the seminar room. That meant that if a seminar was in session and Carol or I were outside the office, when the seminar started, we couldn't get into the office until the seminar was over without interrupting the discussion. Or, if we were in the office, we couldn't get out until the seminar was over. The 
point is that though we were glad to have a diner center at all, it surely wasn't the best environment to hold a seminar. Story two. As the, as the honors program continued to grow, it became more and more clear that we needed more space. And we needed to design that space to include a better seminar. It happened that that early honors center was adjacent to a large open classroom that I thought could be partitioned into a study lounge area and a couple of seminar rooms. So I talked to Tom Moran, then Vice President for Academic Affairs and soon to become Provost of the college, about expanding the Honors Center into that classroom. I could imagine a much better environment for the kind of activity envisioned in the Honors Program design. But I didn't hear back from Tom for <laughs> quite a while, until late one summer afternoon before the fall semester began when the campus was especially quiet, he appeared at my office door. As was often the case, we shared our thoughts about the future of the program and our dreams about the educational experiences we wanted to create for our students. We looked at that empty classroom space thinking about how we could divide up that space to create the environment we needed. To help with the process, I said, Tom, let's get some masking tape and outline on the floor where we think the partitions could be constructed to create a couple of seminar rooms. So we got down on our hands and knees and began outlining where those rooms might be. Now I have to tell you, Anytime you can get a vice president or provost on his hands and knees for anything, you know you're on the right track. And you have his or her attention. But then, Tom was always willing to do whatever he could for the college he loved, including crawling around on his hands and knees. Of course, Neither Tom nor I had any expertise in architecture or interior design. Fortunately, Derek Allen was the college architect at that time, and he quickly transformed our ideas into two seminar rooms in the study lounge we have today. And I want to thank Derek for his essential contribution to creating the ideal seminar environment. Story three. Grading those seminar rooms was only a part of the challenge we faced. Furnishing them in a way that would encourage seminar discussion and dialogue learning, dialogical learning, was a key element of that environment. But getting tables that were large enough and that encouraged conversations and discussions turned out to be impossibly expensive. So I began thinking about materials that might be available locally from which we could construct tables large enough for seating 15 students and their instructor. It occurred to me that tables in the shape of an octagon was the perfect solution. Two seats on each base of an eight-sided shape. Well, the math was pretty simple. And that shape maximized face-to-face -face contact for students and their instructor with no real head seat, except whoever happened to be speaking at the time. Seemed like a good idea to me. We were fortunate in having an art major in the program who was also a skilled woodworker. His name was John Finlayson. And John was willing to spend a summer constructing the tables for us. And though he tragically passed away during his first year of graduate school, I want to remember John's contribution to our ecology of education experiment. Stories four plus. <laughs> put some together here. Uh, there are many stories I could tell about the seminar rooms and the environment they created. 
like the time Laurie Christofferson, our second secretary, came into my office. She said she had heard so many students talk with excitement about the ideas they were exploring in their seminar. She wanted to know if I would let her take a seminar of her own. Of course, I agreed. And Lori started down the path to her own education and now has pursued a, her own career as a teacher. Or, when Colleen Bernard, our fourth secretary, joined the Honors Center, Colleen immediately understood what the Honors Program was about and brought boundless energy into the Honors Center. She was a personal advisor to any student who came into the office, as well as a partner in endless planning. Colleen was never overwhelmed by deadlines or a line of visitors at the door to her office or a crowded calendar of events. She could bring order and organization to the most chaotic problems and a lot of the ecology of the Honors Center took its life and energy from her. And Sandy Bullrus, who came to the Honors Program the last year before I retired, and who became a partner to Dr. Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong deserves a special thanks, too, for taking over the leadership of the Honors Program when I retired. And now, he has turned that program over to Dr. Gozio, the third director of the Honors Program. I think I could produce a story for each of you who are Honors Program alums or who are faculty who have taught in one of the seminar rooms at the table, exploring ideas with their students. In fact, it was not uncommon for faculty who had been teaching a seminar to come by to talk about their experience at the end of the semester. Often they would lament the end of the semester. And in one way or another they would say something like, you know, this is what I thought teaching at the college level would be like. But a question kept nagging at me. How did we know that the environment of the other seminar rooms was having the effect we wanted. Now you have to remember that this was the time in higher education when data gathering seemed to be the only way to answer such questions. Like a lot of faculty in the humanities, I was a little skeptical of that methodology. Remembering that we were, remember that we were hoping to encourage students to become more self-reliant, to accept responsibility for their own education, and putting their ideas out on the table for consideration by others. The German philosopher Immanuel Kant set that standard most clearly, I've always thought, in his little essay, What is Enlightenment? To paraphrase that opening, the opening paragraph of that essay, Kant answers his own question by saying that enlightenment is being free from the need or guidance by others. In other words, being able to think for oneself and accepting the responsibility for doing that. Not a bad way to frame the overall <coughs> goal of other seminars, I thought, or perhaps the goal of the ecology of education itself, especially education in a democracy. Well, it happened that a seminar I was teaching one semester showed me better than any data set could that for at least students in that seminar, things were working out as we had hoped. About halfway through the semester, I walked into the seminar room, sat down with the students who had already gathered there. But before I could begin the discussion of the day, the students said, Doc, we think we've got the idea of the seminar. We were wondering if you would leave and let, let us run the seminar on our own. For the end of the class, we'll come and get you and tell you what we've done. 
I was stunned, to say the least. <laughs> and at first it seemed pretty risky. But, talk about taking responsibility. And they did a superb job. I was pretty sure things were working as we had hoped. I think I'm already exceeding the limits of the good speech guideline that I mentioned at the beginning of these remarks. So I hope each of you, who is an alum of the honors program, will remember your own experience in your favorite seminar room with your favorite seminar instructor. It is not just for me that I'd like the seminar room to be dedicated, but to everyone who has explored ideas in that environment. So in closing, I want to circle back to the ideas I began with about never hearing a bad short speech, <laughs> even if I've violated that principle. I used to teach an honor seminar for incoming freshmen called National Issues from Controversy to Consensus. One task students in that seminar had was to prepare and present a topic on an important national issue to an invited group of students, faculty, and community members under the guidance of another student who had taken the same seminar with me the year before and who became a teaching assistant. After one such forum, one of my teaching assistants that semester, Nishank Bala, an international student from India, gave the best short speech I've ever heard about the ideas at the heart of all honor seminars and seminar rooms. As he helped me carry back materials from the forum to my car that evening, he said to me, Doc, I think I've got it. I think I figured it out. I looked at him quizzically. He said, in an honor seminar, at least, it's better to talk with someone rather than have to sit and listen to someone talk at you. I smiled at him, and I thought, not bad for a short speech. <laughs> I think I will just leave it at that. Thank you all so much for this wonderful honor.